with Sam Cedar. Where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, August 25th, 2023. My name is Emma Viglund in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jamel Bowie, columnist for the New York Times, here to break down this massive week of news. And later in the show, David Dole, a.k.a. the Rational National, will be with us to do the same. Meanwhile, inmate number P01135809, a.k.a. Donald Trump, booked and mugshotted at the Fulton County Jail yesterday evening in prime time. After which he returned to Twitter for the first time since he was banned right after January 6th. To post said mugshot for fundraising purposes, naturally. Or the website formerly known as Twitter, as all the write-ups have to write. <laughs> we will not be engaging in such activity. One of the uh, Georgia co-defendants, a Republican state senator, already points the finger at Trump, saying the fake electors met at his direction. That means Republicans must be starting to take this seriously, right? Of course not. Jim Jordan is launching an investigation into Fulton County DA Fonnie Bellis. Meanwhile, <laughs> Republicans on the Georgia state level are trying to use a newly signed law to oust her from her job. I guess they hate political persecutions. Breaking news, the 150K member strong UAW overwhelmingly votes to authorize a strike could happen right after the deadline if they don't have a contract on September 14th. U.S. mortgage rates are at their highest since 2001 at 7.23% due to Fed rate hikes. The SEC approves stricter rules for private equity financial disclosures as they gobble up restaurant chains, Subway, Arby's, and more. Putin denies involvement in assassinating Prigozhin. We'll just take him at his word. Meanwhile, Ukraine launches its counteroffensive in Crimea, a move that raises some eyebrows because Russia's occupied Crimea since 2014. Maui County sues Hawaiian Electric, the private utility company that services 95% of the state for the wildfires that killed 115 people. Ohio Republicans are trying to trick voters with confusing anti-choice language on November's abortion ballot measure. COVID hospitalizations climbed 22% this week as a highly mutated variant nicknamed Pirola spreads. And lastly, Spanish Soccer Federation President Luis Riabales refuses to step down after forcibly kissing a woman's player on the lips without her consent during the World Cup award ceremony. All this and more on today's Majority Report and this casual Friday, this week finally coming to an end. And it's coming to an end with some good news here, um, at least some fun news. We should just get right into it and we will be spending a good amount of the first hour of this program on Donald Trump and the storied mugshot. Now... Look, I'm still having fun with this. Perhaps I just have a little bit too much lib in my bones. Um, but I got to admit, it was pretty great to see him and what he went with. You know, we didn't know if he was going to go with the smirk or the beaming uh, kind of mocking smile. Instead, according to his aides, he was trying to channel Churchill with this. Uh, I, t I get like revenge of the Sith energy, you know, when... Uh, the when Hayden Christensen was trying to act really intensely in in the third uh, prequel movie, and he just did the scowl the whole time. And when he's going to the dark side, that's how you know. So that's what this this uh, 
the energy I get from this. Let's put this up on the screen. Yeah, there he is. And I think it looks like he's trying not to cry. His eyes are very red. But yeah. the eyebrow cocking is almost like it's it's almost like rock level. He's sort of like I don't can't tell if it's like ironic or not. I, I mean, I think he wanted to look tough. Yeah. 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 It says never surrender after he surrendered he to authorities. <laughs> <laughs> never surrender upon literally surrendering. Donald J. Uh, Trump dot com. Donate to my legal defense, please. He's that's that's I, why he uh, posted on Twitter for the first time since January 8th, since his account was locked. There's a lot of Republicans that are saying, you know, this is exactly you. Sh you shouldn't have done this. Don't let him get in his zone. He's really going to go off now that you did this. This is exactly where he wants uh, us. Um, I huh. just say, like, all that money that could be going to Republican primaries, yes, and that to this guy's uh, legal defense. I'm cool with that. I, I, it is a really fascinating moment in American history when someone's um, existential dread about going to prison is completely intertwined with a political campaign. It seems also like the lawyers and the campaign advisors, it's just one big happy family there, um, which presents just you know, a bunch of different ethical questions but let's put that aside for right now there he is former president of the united states donald trump booked on 13 felony charges in fulton county that's 13 out of 91 individual charges against him right now in total 13 in fulton county four in the federal election case 40 in the classified documents case just because of the number of documents um 34 in the new york one for falsifying business records and What's important here is that no federal pardon works for Trump in this case um, because it's a state case. And in Georgia, they have previously stripped the governor of the power to pardon as well. So that also makes it di more difficult for Trump because, say, there was some you know far right governor who wanted to do so. They wouldn't have that power. The power that they do have, though, um, and we'll get into this definitely with Jamel, is that Fonnie Willis is in, in jeopardy of being ousted from office because Brian Kemp signed a law in May allowing for a basically politicized body to oust prosecutors if they are not sufficiently tough on crime, um, even if they're democratically elected. And this is just like a, a, a Republican playbook now to look you know, tough on crime and to target oftentimes non-white um, reformer prosecutors throughout the state if they choose to maybe not, you know, warehouse people and lock them up with... Uh, it's with, like Willie really Horton sort of policy. Right. Um, and, and, and now it can... And I'm not sure what the intention was from Kemp's end, but he, he signed it and they have fast-tracked it. So it is supposedly going into effect on October 1st. So they could potentially try to get her out of office in retaliation for choosing to go and prosecute uh, Donald Trump. But I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, just something to monitor. Here is the uh, 91 count <laughs> charged uh, in total. Donald Trump speaking to reporters after he surrendered to authorities at the Fulton County Jail. Um, and a reminder that apparently he tried to orchestrate this so this would happen basically in prime time for the news cycle. Um, so he still has that, <laughs> that, uh, that mentality, and, and, and this is what he had to say. It's a very sad day for America. This should never happen. If you challenge an election, you should be able to challenge an election. I thought the election was a rigged election, a stolen election. And I should have every right to do that. As you know, you have many people that you've been watching over the years do the same thing, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Stacey Abrams or many others. When you uh, have that great freedom to challenge, you have to be able to, otherwise you can have very dishonest elections. What has taken place here is a travesty of justice. We did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. And everybody knows it. I've never had such support. And that goes with the other ones, too. What they're doing is election interference. They're trying to interfere with an election. There's never been Netherlands. anything like it in our country before. This is their way of campaigning. And this is one instance, but you have three other instances. It's election interference. So I want to thank you for being here. We did nothing wrong at all. And we have every right, every single right, 
to challenge an election that we think is dishonest, that we think it's very dishonest. So thank you all very much, and I'll see you uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Back to Bedminster. Um, You did challenge the election, and you lost those multiple, multiple, multiple court challenges. Uh, and then you went around that, and uh, with the rest of your co-conspirators, cooked up a scheme that would submit fake electors, a.k.a. fake vote totals, to the official count in order to install yourself in power. That is not what Hillary Clinton did when she talked about Russian interference in the election. Even if it was t overblown and a way to deflect blame from her loss, that uh, is not the same. That is the actual free speech protection there. She can say whatever the hell she wants. She could have said Russia changed the vote totals and she still would not have been prosecuted because that's the fee free speech protection. Uh, also, she would have been prosecuted if she chose to ask, like, go around the process and ask the electors to change the results that they were tabulating right. and submitting. Yeah, That's the fraud. Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, the difference was like also that like with regards to like the electoral college thing, it's like people were trying to change that not to like commit fraud um, and say like, oh, there's something fishy about this election, but to say like, hey, uh, maybe we should go with the popular vote instead right. of with this, this sort of old system. Yes. That's a completely different political project that doesn't involve like calling people up and you know, asking them to find votes for you. Right. And then, I mean, it, with the Stacey Abrams case, there was legitimate, uh, I think, um accusations there because the guy she was running against the current or brian kemp right the current governor of of georgia was in charge of the electoral process at that time in his capacity as was it secretary of state or attorney general secretary, secretary of state so um i, I mean it just and, and and stacey abrams once that challenge concluded did she went away and looking did for votes yeah she did not she did not do that she did not call and pressure people as a part of a criminal scheme. And so the free speech argument, that's all they've got, honestly. And it's just silly because even I said this before when we went through the Jack Smith federal indictment, it on the second page goes to great lengths to say Trump had the right to lie. He had to, the right to say whatever the hell he wanted. He had the right to challenge all of these results in the courts. What he did not have the right to do is to try to one the first prong of that, at least in the federal indictment, is is pressure Mike Pence. And then the one that's a little more relevant here is try to pressure either state legislatures or the electors to change the results of what they had tabulated. And so it is laughable for me. I mean, I it, it's hard to see how at least one of the two election cases does not end in a conviction. I, for, I, I don't understand based on the evidence in front of us, how, how that changes any, or how, how, that, how he's going to weasel out of this. But at the same time, it's, I, I don't want to catch or count my chickens before, yeah. you know. I'm not protecting court cases. Yeah, we can't. We can't. Even one where we have much more of the available facts than we would in, say, like a standard case. I'm not, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't treat these things as if they are rational <laughs> um, processes. Like, yes. yeah, sure, you could predict it based on what we know, but, you know, we'll see. This is a good day. I mean, and um, hey, <laughs> not not a not a mass incarceration fan over here, right? Um, but or a mugshot fan, or a mugshot I'll fan, say. because those are used often to they, they ruin people's all. lives, yes, right? It's, it should we should complete if if Trump wants to get behind an effort to reform um, how we use public mugshots to uh, shame people and how it has n negative culture effects. You know, I'm not going to hold my. Well, he, but but he he actually, I think, loves the mugshot. He 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 just used it to. No, I know, I know exactly. But I'm saying, like, people that are acting like this is some sort of, it was bad that he was making, like Ben Shapiro saying, like, it was completely unreasonable that he was made to have a mugshot. He's one of the most photographed people. It's like, it would be unreasonable if you didn't make him go through the awful process that we make everybody else yeah. that we over police in this country go through. Yeah. So. um Really incredible moment and, and, and a good one just to, to wrap up my thoughts here because in, if we want this to be a functional society, this kind of accountability is, is necessary and long overdue. Um, we should have prosecuted George W. Bush and Dick Cheney for war crimes. <laughs> um, and we had Nancy Pelosi leading the Democratic Party at the time basically saying, let's turn the page. Obama turned the page. And, 
I mean, we turned the page on Iran Contra with Reagan. We turned the page uh, by not prosecuting Nick, uh, 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 Ford did by not prosecuting Nick, uh, Nixon, um, and more. Uh, we have, a, unfortunately, in this country, a long history of. I mean, there's not, no strikes with the Democratic presidents. We yeah, should take a look at. True. Right. Exactly. Um, Obama assassinated a, uh, a United States citizen. A uh, that should have been a. A criminal probe but we did not did not do that because despite all of our high lofty opinions of of the american justice system in fact our track record is one of allowing powerful people to get away with things but there's no higher crime to this country than trying to overturn the election and remain in power in spite of the popular will of the people so Sure. Yeah, the documents gonna... case, the 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 New York hush money, you know, uh, case, uh, great. But the stuff about the crimes against democracy, this yes. is where the heart of the issue is. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think um, this sort of thing, there's there is it, the whole like if they can do this to a president, they can do this. Like we know, um, we cage more people in this country than any others. Um, but he should be treated like um, Janine Inez in Bol Bolivia. Like anybody who does, these are crimes against democracy. And we do need to have, like, anybody. And to me, it's like, it, as somebody who, like, has long cared about free speech, I was like a big index on censorship person before I was a socialist in college. Like, I, I, I value those principles, but you have to. I, th I think you can't talk about them without talking about how they're being used as a Trojan horse for, like, complete, like, world historical anti-democratic um sort of uh attempts and yeah right um 100 percent all right guys uh, do we have a do uh we have a quick word from one of our sponsors and then when we come back we'll be joined by uh jamel Bowie. thank you emma sponsor for today's program give well i've talked about give well many times in the past uh when you donate money to a charity uh, a lot of times you're going to wonder how much impact is my dollars actually making? It's hard to find out information, hard to know like which charities are spending what on what and are, are, are what they doing effective. Uh, but if you're interested in having, in, 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 in giving money uh, to a charity and you want to know what is creating the most meaningful difference for some of the poorest people in the world, check out GiveWell. They have research, evidence-backed, high-impact giving opportunities, and they share their work for everyone for free. GiveWell has spent over 15 years uh, researching charitable organizations. They only recommend a few of the highest impact opportunities they found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site. It is totally free. You can make a tax deductible donation to their recommended funds or organizations and GiveWell uh, uh, or organizations and GiveWell does not take a cut. There's all sorts of things that are on their top list. Uh, you know, bed nets to prevent malaria. Five bucks can provide one net. Nets can reduce the number of malaria infections. Enough nets and a large drop in infections can save a life uh, in expectation. Uh, preventative medication for, for malaria costs about seven bucks to provide a child with malaria treatment through high malarial season. These treatments uh, reduce the amount of uh, malaria infections and with enough treatments, also save a life in expectation. Vitamin A supplements, it costs about a buck a day. It costs about a buck, I should say, to deliver vitamin A supplement to a child. Vitamin A deficiency can increase mortality rates. Vitamin A distributions can save a life by reducing vitamin A deficiency. Cash incentives for things like routine childhood vaccines cost about $160 to vaccinate an infant. This uh, funding provides cash transfers to incentivize caregivers to bring in babies to clinics for routine childhood vaccinations. I found Give Directly through GiveWell, no relation. We've donated thousands uh, via the show to Give Directly. Uh, they give great recommendations over at GiveWell. 
you can find exactly how much of the money is going to the charity and what impact it has. Go to givewell.org to find out more or make a donation. And if you make a donation, let them know you heard about it uh, by choosing podcast when they ask you, how did you hear about us? And enter the majority report, with Sam Cedar, at checkout. Again, that's givewell.org and let them know that we sent you by choosing podcast and majority report, givewell.org. Now back to the show. And back. We are back now, and we are joined uh, once again by Jamel Bowie, columnist over at the New York Times, uh, here to break down this week in news with us. Uh, Jamel, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So, um, you know, important news week. Trump booked in Georgia. We got uh, we got that that illustrious mugshot. Um, what do you make of the news or like some of the reporting that he wanted this booking to happen in prime time and then also paired with his strategic return to Twitter, which is essentially his attempt to, to fundraise off of this? I mean, I think Trump, he is, if nothing else, an old fashioned showman. And the way he sees it is there's no such thing as bad publicity. Right. <laughs> so he can yeah. get this. He gets this booking, this mugshot. He poses for this mugshot. Very obviously, I wouldn't be shocked if he spent the day practicing that pose. Um, and he can use it to fundraise. He can use it to rally his supporters, make him look persecuted. I mean, all sorts of things. I think he views it as uh, unambiguously good a good opportunity press wise for him. And I don't think he seriously thinks anything is going to really happen to him. I think that's the other piece of this. So um, I think from his perspective, it makes total sense to want to turn this into like an event of sorts. Um, I, I I happen to think that maybe he should take it. He should take it a, a little more seriously given uh, the state of his legal team and the extent to which, um, you know, for each of these indictments, whether the state one or the federal one, the, uh, the prosecutors appear to be quite serious <laughs> about this. But uh, I think for Trump, Trump sees it as, you know, this is another episode of the Trump show. Uh, do, do you really think that he it hasn't sunk in for him that this is serious? Because it seems like at least his presidential campaign is somewhat frantic in its, like, it, it, it's existential for him in that if he does not win the presidency he's there's a very good chance he's going to prison slash jail and um i don't know it's hard to psychoanalyze him because he's so insane but there <laughs> there's th there has to be some understanding there uh i would imagine yeah it, that is that's the thing right i think if you look at his if you look at his decision to run for president in the first place if you look at um this campaign it, it's clear that he understands on some level that this, the difference between winning and losing, as he suggested, will be the difference between being able to be free and maybe being j be in prison, um, or at least be under you know serious legal scrutiny for the rest of his life. At the same time, I don't think he can release himself from the compulsion to like attract attention and get press. And so the... Uh, the booking yesterday, even if he recognizes that in substance this is all very serious, I don't think he can actually help himself. I think I think there's there's no world in which Donald Trump did not try to turn his mugshot into a fundraising opportunity in an, in an attempt to like you know get more press. I just think that he is pathologically unable to resist that temptation and to, to really perform the seriousness of the charges against him. Certainly. And I mean, just uh, reflecting on the nature of these charges as well um, is, is it, it can get lost in the spectacle. But this was an attempt, uh, a well thought out attempt to overturn the Democratic results of an election involving a variety of, you know, uh, now what's it, 19 co-conspirators, including Donald Trump in this instance, for Georgia. Um, and in the federal indictment, there's uh, six co-conspirators plus Trump. And so much of this is about really throwing out votes, specific votes, Democratic votes, and in the cases of what they tried to do in Georgia and, in, and, and some of their... Uh, plots in places like Michigan, particularly urban centers, um, people that were more uh, people of color and also people that were tending to vote Democratic. And 
I think that that context is really important to understanding the the bile behind this like and that includes Giuliani saying those that poll worker mother and daughter were passing around USB ports like vials of heroin and cocaine um if you could just put it in l the larger context of voting rights and who gets to have voting rights and who doesn't have to get voting rights and or d doesn't get to have voting rights in this country yeah of course I mean I think I think you got I think you kind of set up set it up quite well right that like the the plot um, really centered on trying to invalidate, you know, erase whatever whatever verb you want to use, the votes of uh, voters in the urban centers, Atlanta, Milwaukee, um, uh, Philadelphia. These are all the places right. they they targeted, and that's sort of just like a euphemism for saying they wanted to they wanted to invalidate the votes of black people. They didn't see them as not just that they were democratic votes, but that in some sense they didn't really count. And that's like part of the language of Republican politics that voters in these places don't really count. They're not really real Americans, right? We don't, we don't want a popular vote for president because we don't want our elections being determined by people in urban centers. And it's like, well, they're Americans too. They presumably, their votes count the same as everyone else, but sort of on, a, on like this um it's like ontological level for for uh, a lot of folks on that side they don't they are unequal votes and don't deserve to have the same say and i think the plot to steal the election was like that idea taken to its logical conclusion right that if those votes are illegitimate then we should be able to erase them from the ledger and then put in the rightful president and the, the, the other thing i want to i want to add here is that you know two years? It's been what two years, three years since the election, just about, and then two years since January six, a little more than two years, and it's tempting, I think, looking back to treat this all as kind of a a big kind of a little silly, you know, like circus. Oh well, this yeah, yeah, circus. This really wasn't going to succeed, but you read that federal indictment, and um, Jeffrey Clark, I believe, you know, suggests to the White House Assistant Counsel that, like, listen, if there are protests after we do this, we'll just bring in the army and shoot these people. And it's like that's what was being considered in the White House, um, that if they were able to successfully invalidate these votes and there would be protests and civil unrest afterwards, they were going to use force against American citizens to sort of, like, solidify and cement their hold on power. So I think it's worth... I think it's worth just saying, right, that like for as much as this seems like a big circus, these people were actually, you know, no pun intended, deadly serious about what they were trying to do and were deadly serious about what they intended to do to maintain that grip on power. I mean, that's why you have to call it a coup attempt. I mean, and, and people, there were a lot of um, people who uh, like to be contrarians on the on on in uh, political discourse saying you know oh look at these msnbc liberals calling it a coup how 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 quaint how silly how hysterical and then you see oh no they want it, there were attempts to also install jeffrey clark as the attorney general and want, and and only if it were if it weren't for a Department of Justice internal revolt on that front where they said, hell no, that could have been possible. And he could have used the Insurrection uh, Act to turn federal troops on anti-Trump protesters just to like hammer that point home of what was being discussed at the highs, highest levels of power in the Trump administration. Right. And we, we I think people a lot of people have the sensation to kind of dismiss that as talk but like at the level of presidential politics at the level of at those levels of power talk isn't simply talk talk represents an exercise of power and so if people in the white house are discussing these sorts of tactics in furtherance of a plot to 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 overturn the results of the election that is the, i mean that that is the most serious thing one can imagine in a, in a democracy, in a sensibly democratic country. It is something that deserves, if not political scrutiny, then certainly like, you know, some legal scrutiny. And that's what we're getting now. Um, but I think, you know, I, I I myself have even, you know, fallen into the the habit of kind of talking about this. It's like, oh, this, this is a clown show. Um, but it's worth reading that federal indictment. It's worth reading the state indictment and really reminding oneself that um, this was all very serious. This was all very, very serious. And the difference between a world or the distance between a world in which it failed, the one we live in, and a world in which we succeeded, isn't 
that far, right? It it, mm. it 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 amounts to sort of like a relative handful of people <laughs> making the right this right choices and decisions at critical points. But those people didn't have to be there. Uh, could have been other people. Could have been less scrupulous people. Could have been less honest people, and we would have had a very different outcome. And that's I think that's something to remember. Certainly, and. And while in in the public, they're, I think, using this free speech defense, which really doesn't hold um, any muster because it wasn't the speech. The federal indictment goes to uh, great lengths to say that the speech is protected. It was the uh, the plots, the fraud attempts, the actions that followed. Um, they can't use that in court, I, I think, to any real degree. What it seems like they're zeroing in on is... <laughs> You can't get a fair trial in D.C. because, right. you know, you can't get a fair trial in Fulton County because, you know, Fannie Willis. And uh, the there it's kind of boiling underneath the surface. But uh, in May, Brian Kemp signed a law that allows for the removal of prosecutors uh, who aren't sufficiently tough on crime was, I guess, the pri the motivator that was stated on its face. But it's being fast tracked to go into effect in October which means that there's a possibility that the Republican legislature in Georgia could remove Fannie Willis from her position in the midst of this critical moment. And I mean, th now that's really a, a, a terrifying prospect, at least in terms of the precedent that it sets. I'm not sure it would kill the investigation. I doubt it would, but still. Right. I mean, I think, I think, um, or the trial, I should say. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> It's very clear that this is dividing Republicans, and there are many Republicans who are so very loyal to Donald Trump. And so, I, you know, I I would not be shocked to see the Georgia legislature attempt to do that. I, you know, the, I want to quickly comment on this claim, this charge that Trump will never be able to get a fair trial. Um, I mean, I think because he's Donald Trump, he's a former president, right? That does add the inherent difficulty that people, if people are polarized on anything, it's their views of Donald Trump and everyone yeah. has one. Um, and that's like a real consideration, but you know, I, I actually, I've been on a jury. I was like on a week long jury. And, um, I will say people take that very seriously. And I, I, you know, I think, I think we have a habit of underestimating the degree to which Americans will take their civic duty seriously when they're presented to them seriously. When you when you say this is a thing to take seriously and this is a thing to the best of your abilities, you're going to need to be unbiased and uh, non-partial. Um, people will really try to do that. Uh, and so I think I, I, I have a total confidence that, in fact, Donald Trump will be, will be able to get a fair trial, even from people who likely oppose him or voted against him. Um, I think the idea that he can't, that it's impossible, is in fact kind of buying into one of the conceits of that a whole ideological movement, which is that the entire you know apparatus of the state of the government is biased against us, and so we have to dismantle it to get fairness. Like, no, people are capable of being fair. People are capable of being not partial. And this process, I'd say, has been nothing but fair. If Donald Trump were any other person in America, mm -hmm. the book would have been thrown at him years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's been, it, this has been beyond fair-minded and scrupulous. Yeah, even the documents case. I mean, he had months and just ignored repeated requests and then sent back some of the documents, just not all of them, in an effort to conceal what he still wanted to hang on to. And other, you know, low-level government officials who maybe have classified information um, and, and by accident or took it, they, they don't get that benefit of the doubt of returning it. Uh, there was a case, and I'm blanking on the name of the person, but uh, the one of the, someone who worked with the DOJ or the FBI who just went to jail for like 10 months. Because, yeah. McGonagall? The, Might have been. Yeah, the, I, I, I can't remember the, Like names. the Russian the thing with the, yeah, I'll, I'll double check. Yeah, I just a, Charles McGonagall. Sure. Yeah, and, 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 and so he actually, in that case in particular, was given as, as much uh, deference and leeway as humanly possible because of his position, um, which is the exact opposite of his claim, obviously. Right, right. Yeah, so um, it, it, insane stuff. But um, it, speaking of uh, the guy that's leading in the Republican polls by 40, 50 points, that there was a uh, an audition for the B team or the C team uh, over 
on uh, on Wednesday. I was going to say over the weekend, but it hasn't been that long. Uh, on Wednesday, the what's your what was your take about that debate? Um, because it was a very odd exercise of nobody appearing presidential because the they all seem to be like have some collective understanding that this isn't anything any real exercise without the front runner being here and i also found it odd that none of them really went after desantis at all yeah i mean you you said suggested this was a c team and i kind of think it's the c team too you know there, there's individual critiques you could make of each of the people on the stage, right? That like Ron DeSantis for being someone who's supposed to be this like, you know, pugilistic fighter type was actually quite passive mm -hmm. and unimpressive uh, and a little whiny uh, every time he was questioning anything. Uh, Tim Scott, who I've seen in a variety of circumstances, uh, who's usually kind of gregarious and, and good natured on the stump is like utterly listless on the stump, like sort of struggling to, to make his point. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy is, you know, the worst possible like Mati Win kid ever imaginable yes. um, yeah. placed on stage. Uh, and, you know, fast talking, but not, not really much there. I mean, you can kind of go down the list. But the thing that struck me the most was that this, the, the relative weakness of this field um, is, I think, actually a testament to how much Donald Trump's dominance really is papering over all of these like profound problems within Amer Republican politics. And that there's an extent to which the unwillingness of Republican office holders and elites to break from Trump in any serious way reflects a kind of knowledge that like if Trump is gone, then we don't really have that much. And you can even hear that in the messaging on stage on Wednesday, right? Everyone kind of reverted to this almost 2012, 2013 vintage language about the debt and the military and all these things. And it just felt like completely disconnected from any actual problems or, or challenges facing the country. It was all sort of reheated rhetoric from a decade ago. Yeah, um, exactly the kind of rhetoric that when Trump ran in 2015 and 2016, he kind of just like tossed off and was like, this is ridiculous. These aren't the real problems. And his diagnosis, of course, was insane. But he did recognize that like what they were saying was not really responsive to what people were feeling or thinking or, or even wanted to hear. And it was just so strange how with him off off the stage for the first time Trump has not been on a stage like this and what six years, seven years he's he's been that that presence for that long. with him not there, they didn't know what to talk about. yeah um, they didn't really know what to, what to, how to connect. And um, I think it's I think it's like a demonstration of exactly how and why Trump got to where he was within the Republican Party. He, he kind of might he kind of remains the only guy in the field with any any like juice, you know. Let's uh, let's play this Nikki Haley thing because this fits into what I wanted to to talk with you about Jamel. Um, just how uh, Vivek went took the maximalist positions on all of you know the most uh br brutish uh republican impulses whether it be uh just being incredibly you know saying i want israel's border policies down at the mexico border or uh, uh saying the climate change agenda is a hoax right S giving the red meat to the base and and he has the ability to do so with no real political background it's just it's all theater for him and he's auditioning for i don't know some the cable news show or VP or something <laughs> like that. But, but, but this, the, the difference between the, what you're seeing growing within the base um, and the, the establishment Republicans and what their true agenda is, is really fascinating. You saw a little bit of it in the um, back and forth between Vivek Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley on um Ukraine, uh, with the, the differences between the more traditional neoconservative, uh, pro uh, Pentagon kind of uh, military industrial complex thinking, and this libertarian uh, uh, leaning uh, ideology, I guess. But also, what they didn't flesh out is Nikki Haley and Chris Christie and some of the other traditional Republicans want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Um, is that this the clip uh, of of Nikki Haley on Social Security and Medicare? Let's play this because uh, this is just a reminder. Yeah, this is not the one. Um, it's the other one. This is a reminder of exactly what the Republican Party 
agenda is when essentially Trump is out of the well, picture and isn't disciplining them um, on this issue because he kind of cut out Republicans' legs in these latest negotiations with Biden out from under them when he said uh, we shouldn't touch Social Security and Medicare. But this is really what they want to do. Well, you know, you've got multiple candidates on that stage that said they wouldn't touch entitlements, including Trump. And any candidate that says they're not going to touch entitlements means that they're basically going to go into the uh, go into office and then leave America bankrupt. Social Security is going to go bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare is going to go bankrupt in eight. So the way we deal with it is we don't touch anyone's retirement or anyone who's been promised in. But we go to people like my kids in their 20s when they're coming into the system and we say the rules have changed. We change retirement age to reflect life expectancy. Instead of cost of living increases, we do it based on inflation. We limit the benefits the on the wealthy and we expand Medicare Advantage plans. What's the right age there then, Ambassador? Well, I think we have to do the numbers. We've got to figure out what it is. But what we do life know is 65 is way too low yeah. and we need to increase that. We need to do it according to life expectancy. Yeah, as Matt says, life expectancy is going down. Um, and also there are studies that show that the longer you work, the shorter your life expectancy can be. Almost as if, you know, uh, having to work until your elder years is not great for your health. And just to fact check her, no Social Security and Medicare are not going bankrupt. Yet the Social Security Trust Fund is a little bit more in like financial precarity because of Treasury bonds. But that is quite easily fixed uh, by just raising the cap. There are a lot of things that you can do, but this is just this is the austerity agenda of the Republican Party that is as foundational to what they believe in as anything else. That's right. I mean, the, Trump's to the extent that Trump had like any innovation when he in the 2016 race, it was sort of jettisoning all of that. Right. Saying, you know, saying to voters, basically, like, I know you're I know you're here for the anti-immigrant stuff. I know you're here for sort of like the meanness and everything. So I'm going to focus on that. I know you don't want to hear someone talk about taking your Medicare or Social Security. That's very unpopular. So I'm not going to do it. Um, and that that work. And it is fascinating to see that, you know, when he's not on the stage, they just go back to talking about it, kind of unaware that it's um, that it's politically unpopular. I think in Haley's case, he's trying to present herself as sort of the only serious adult on the stage, though, as you as you as you say, the claim she's making about those programs, they're going to go bankrupt in some way, uh, just don't really hold up to scrutiny. Like, how can if Social Security goes bankrupt, a program that more or less is financed by existing workers paying taxes mm -hmm. to current beneficiaries. So if that goes bankrupt, what that means is that like society is collapsed, right? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what that means. It's self-sustaining. Um, I mean, there is right. in theory, but you know, they want to be able to cut into it and, and create more leverage for people to remain in the workforce. That's their agenda. That's right. And to, and to siphon, siphon the money um, into private accounts that, you know, mutual funds and private equity can like sk skim off of for their own profit. So, yeah, that's that's the agenda. It's very unpopular, um, uh, and they cannot help but go back to it, which I think gets gets to this point of kind of just like an intellectual exhaustion among mainstream Republicans that is being that has been papered over really by uh, by Trump's uh, dominance of the entire Republican Party. It, it feels like I'll say it feels to some extent that all of this is like very theoretical in terms of talking, because as you as you said at the top. Trump leads the field by like 40 points, right? Like he's there's Nikki Haley, I think, is pulling three or four percent in the polling. Ron DeSantis, who's supposed to be like his closest, Trump's closest competitor, is pulling 11, 12 percent. Like no one, tr Trump is winning the majority of Republicans and no one else really even comes remotely close. And so this, this feels all a little academic. Like at the end of the day, you know, even if he is, you know, faces considerably more legal trouble than he does. There's nothing that says you can't run for president and also um, uh, be in court. So there's a good chance that he he still gets the nomination, and it is is the nominee going into going into next fall. And all of this is a little a little moot. And I think you're right that on Wednesday, everyone kind of perceived that this was like a very strange exercise and pretending as if the actual unquestioned leader of the Republican Party uh, isn't, you know, part of this discussion. Yeah, and it just, it, 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 it's so clear that the Republican base 
there's no appetite for cutting Social Security and Medicare, no matter how much they want to call it entitlements, no matter how much they want to obscure it. Um, that was always all the hatred of um, non-white people, of gay people, of trans people always was a way to get them to a position where they could deliver for their donors, for the people that they serve. Uh, it was cynical. Some are true believers, some aren't. I don't know how much it matters. Um, but in the end, the Republican base really just wanted, like, the hatred part. And that's what Trump delivers to them. Uh, and so when the Republican Party or someone like Nikki Haley is trying to move back to, like, what the talk it, it, watered down tea party talking points i mean it just she seems like a dinosaur and completely disconnected from anything that regular republicans actually want their candidate to sound like i think that's right um i i, I don't i don't put much stock into uh, vivek ramaswamy's chances but he he's like the only one who seems to kind of grasp that the republican base is kind of moved on from the 2010s and is looking for something bombastic, for something that involves like defining and targeting enemies and promising that you're going to use the government to go after them, which is basically what what he did. Climate change activists are enemies. I'm going to go after them. Um, uh, federal bureaucrats are enemies. I'm going to go after them, and so on and so forth. So I think I think that's what Republican voters want to hear. And Ramaswamy is delivering it. DeSantis is kind of delivering it, although not particularly well. But any attempt to articulate kind of a updated version of uh tea party republicanism circa 2012 republicanism kind of the the kind of rhetoric that mitt romney ran on in that election um, or that you know the other republican candidates ran on in 2016 i just don't think it's gonna land very well with voters who are republican voters who um don't want that and part of the problem is they don't want that and they want a candidate who's going to deliver it to them but most voters don't want that uh what most voters don't want what Republican voters want. Uh, and so that puts the nominee in a difficult position. Just to, to make one quick point about that debate, it was interesting, right, that they had this whole exchange about abortion, which kind of hinged around Haley, really trying to get ev everyone to not talk about it. Yep. Um, uh, uh, because she recognizes that, like, listen, this is electoral poison. But it but, but everyone had to mansplain it to her, right? They had to right. mansplain why the federal <laughs> abortion was needed. <laughs> or um, federal abortion ban i should say but this is like the dilemma right republican yeah. voters want to hear a nominee say i'm going to get to washington and i'm going to ban abortion and uh most of the voting electorate hears that and they say no thank you and yeah. um uh they will vote the other way it was interesting. I think it was really only Pence and Asa Hutchinson who said that they would do a federal abortion ban and the rest of them you know say well, we'll leave it to the states. But for honestly, just to say it, to to have another moment of positive uh, feelings about like the general American population on this front, um, just like them having their uh, taking their civic duty seriously when it comes to being on a jury, it's they understand now that the I think the Republicans are lying about the states' rights thing um, because the the they the. Lindsey Graham did them a favor <laughs> by proposing that that 15 week ban uh, basically uh, qu quite quickly uh, after Roe was overturned, uh, much to the, the, the dismay of Mitch McConnell and others. But, um, you know, it, th there's there's no trust there on this issue and abortion rights are broadly popular. And we'll see what happens in Ohio uh, in November, right, when they take uh, right. take that up on the ballot. But the the this is a really ma Trump is a losing issue for them if he's the candidate obviously and abortion is and this is perhaps the 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 saving grace for Biden who in any other time would be a weak candidate um but but he has great negative partisanship on his side and the twin issues of like the democracy at stake and your abortion rights at stake yeah, I think that's right. I think we'll also want to look to the Virginia uh, state elections in the fall where the Republican governor, Glenn Youngkin, is really investing a lot in trying to flip the state house and hold the state uh, or flip the state Senate and hold the state house delegates. If he can do that, then he'll have the votes to do an abortion ban. So this this 
election in Virginia is really being fought on the question of abortion rights. All the Republicans are doing as much as they can to avoid talking about it. Um, I think if Democrats can hold, can hold the state Senate, uh, then that will also be a, give us a sense of where the public is in terms of you know, how they connect Republicans winning elections to the future of their rights. Right, exactly. Um, let's uh, let's briefly touch on this too, uh, just because you know the the planet burning in front of us is is something maybe we should talk about on on our program. Um, yeah, Maui. That that the 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 images um, out of uh, Lahaina. The uh, the the reaction from the right of being unable to deal with it, except in terms of just insane conspiracy theories involving Chinese space lasers and paired with what we saw on the debate stage, which was um, really uh, terrifying stuff from every single candidate in response to how we can combat climate change. And as we said earlier, Ramaswamy took the maximalist position of let's burn coal and the climate change agenda is a hoax. But, um, you know, we're we're in a very pivotal moment <laughs> as the the planet continues to burn and it just seems like there is there still is not the political path forward to handling the scope of this crisis um and we're going to continue to see more of these things yeah we are going to continue to see more of these things you know the it, depending on how implementation works out the inflation reduction act could go a long way and at least beginning to decarbonize the American economy, um, uh, beginning to address our carbon emissions. But I do think, I think you're right that these kinds of natural disasters, wildfires, flooding, you know, extreme weather events, they're going to become more frequent. There's going to be more, um, uh, more people are going to die as a result of them. There'll be more, you know, refuge, climate refugees internal to the United States. That's, that's going to happen. And it's striking to see, how much Republican conservative ideology just has no response to it, um, has no has no response to it that is constructive, right? I can imagine, you know, let's say that there is a disaster uh, south of the U.S. border and it results in sort of like migra- greater attempts at greater migration to the U.S. Well, they have a solution to that. It's right to lock down the border and start shooting at people. But in terms of like anything proactive to prevent. Um, or proactive to deal with the consequences of, there's not really anything there from the Republican Party. And I think that exchange in the debate stage, um, the extent to which the Republican conversation and the conservative conversation around Maui, as you said, is all conspiracies and like criticism of Biden not speaking on the beach, I guess, um, and, and not really any kind of taking seriously what climate change means for uh, human habitation, what climate change means for um, the safety of Americans around the country. Uh, uh, not, none of that, none of that. Just a, a party that's complete does not take this com- seriously whatsoever. And, you know, the fact that this is the number one issue for young Americans, right? This that was is my what next young question. Yeah. Are very right. concerned about that. <laughs> Ramaswamy has that proposal to like raise the voting age to 25 by constitutional amendment, which isn't going to happen. But you can see why a guy who thinks climate change is a hoax would also want that too, right? Like if you are aware that the number one issue for voters under under 30 basically is something you're just never going to try to really address, and that's going to polarize those voters against you. Um, well, what do you do about that? I guess you can try to keep them from voting. But I think, yeah, I I, I think the Republican Party. Uh, I don't think it's doomed or anything, right? Like that's that's always it's silly to predict electoral doom, but it will be interesting to see how it begins to deal with the fact that there are many, many Americans entering the electorate who um, this is their their this is their issue. This is what they care about. This is what they, what they want to see the government do something about. And um, you're saying to them, I don't even believe, believe it exists. That, that disconnect, I don't understand. I don't know how they can bridge it. Um, I mean, they're going to need some sort of new industry to capture them for them to serve at some point once eventually, hopefully, we face fossil fuels out. I mean, that that's the, the, they don't know where to go. They don't know which, what money to follow at, at this moment is my take. 
Yeah, maybe that's it. I think there's some, I think we should never underestimate sincerity. I think there's probably a lot of sincere belief that it is actually like all overstated. But as, as these, you know, we, we had a hundred degree water waters, right? Like as these events keep stacking up, um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that political movement integrates the knowledge into its own goals. And maybe it doesn't at all. And maybe it just is in a permanent state of denial, um, which is bad for everyone, right? Like it would be yeah. better. It would be better. I'm not saying I would agree with Republican climate change solutions, but it, it would be better if they had like ideas <laughs> and like yeah. proposals, right? You can negotiate with that. Um, it's hard to negotiate with someone who like stares you dead in the face and says like, well, I just don't think the thing is real. The, you, th those clouds in the horizon that you say you see, they're not there. Right. Well, uh, Jamel Bowie, columnist over at the uh, New York Times, a uh, proprietor of the Unclear and Present Danger podcast. I meant to plug that uh, at the start. Thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right, guys, quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by David Dole. We are back and we are joined now by David Dole, host of the Rational National, or are you, are you the Rational National? What is, how does that, how uh, do you, how do you? I kind of want to change the name. I'm like over it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the, it might be too late. I guess late. I am the Rational National. Yeah, it's too late now. You can't, once you commit, it's uh, for, you know, six years, it's, it's too late to change it now. But I think it's I guess good, I am the Rational National. I think it's a good name, David. I yeah. still remember the very first time I heard it and I thought you were a, maybe a right wing sort of uh, a centrist <laughs> contrarian podcast. Oh, like, if we want to go back to, if we want to go back to 2017, <laughs> when I called in to say the, the show to uh, defend Jimmy Dore, we, we, let's not go back there. <laughs> was that a thing? It was, so it was this brief time right before it was very clear what Jimmy was doing. The point that I was trying to make back then, it wasn't necessarily to defend Let's start Jimmy with your most how... embarrassing take right off the bat. Yes, Here we no, go. I think, <laughs> I think it's important to clear the air <laughs> now that okay. I'm back on, you know, years later. It was actually the funny thing. It was the, it was the first week that Jamie had started on the show. And I think it was the first time sh she saw Sam yell at a caller. And that was me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes yeah and it's because yeah i mean look we were all working through the because i think we all agree that the democrats are not satisfactory yes <laughs> yes just, yeah you know, different ways to approach that but yeah i, I remember being like because there was all of the like new atheist sort of stuff but i i i, I think you look i have left reckoning that's very like left coded uh beats people over the head with it i think it's good to have things that aren't just automatically seen as like that's true leftist podcast because people so. might click on it and think like i love some rationality and nationality exactly. and nationalities yeah, yeah, yeah. yep um the, uh, the point I, I was trying to make back then though that i didn't really get across but was that um and, and i now know that i'm wrong and i'll tell you why was that uh, because Jimmy and Sam knew each other that I thought maybe Sam could try and like behind the scenes push him in the right direction. Uh, since then, I, you know, I, I got to know Jimmy a little better and realized <laughs> you can't do that. No, no. <laughs> There's no yeah. doing that with Jimmy. He's no. not a great listener. Um, no, we'll, no, we'll just, not at all. We'll just put that out there. I also wanted to read this here. Kowalski from Nebraska, one of our favorites, says, please let David Dole know that I appreciate him uh, excite." Exiting leftist mafia uh, at a reasonable time most nights when his colleagues continue on early, until the early hours of the morning. It, uh, it feels like and only should and only seem to be able to read one super chat message every five minutes. Um, yeah. So uh, every single so, so we do leftist mafia uh, at eight thirty p.m. every single uh, Thursday, and it initially started for you know a couple hours, and then we would end the show. Since then, we started doing super chats, and now that we can connect all of our accounts to the live stream, we're all getting super chats. 
there have been some days that have gone five hours and <laughs> we're talking like well into like you know past past midnight i have a child i have yes, to wake up right. in the morning. i mean to, to be fair bender has two i don't know how the hell he does it but he <laughs> he's on all night answering all the super chats last night i'm like i gotta bow it early because we also covered the debate live yeah uh, the day before and that was just too draining for me to do two you know four hour streams in a rows <laughs> i just bowed out yeah, I hear you. Um, I, I, Bender just, you know, he's built different, uh, as the kids say. He's, I don't he, know how he does it. He enjoys this stuff so much. Um, that debate was, well, first, before we get into the debate, uh, Trump mugshot, well, how do you rank it? I mean, in terms of like, if you were Tyra Banks yeah. and judging him on America's Next Top Model, he, <laughs> he's, he, it's a little menacing. It's not much, so much of a smize as she would encourage people to do. It, that's smiling with your eyes for people who ne never watch that show um, and still have more brain cells than I do. But, uh, but I, you know, it, it was still for me satisfying to see the mugshot. I, I'll be real. My, my first reaction was I was surprised how close it was to the fake one because the fake one had been circ circulating for like the, the hour like the hour before yes and then the real one came out and it's it's that but he just looks a little thinner like it, it's just a serious looking face Binder made the point last night and uh, I agree with him that Trump should have smiled like if he wants to really if he wanted to really make this a thing and like sell even more t-shirts to you know fund his his defense. Uh, that he should have smiled, done something, I don't know, weird. <laughs> like, but it's just a very basic, I think it's going to be quickly forgotten. I like a lot of the uh, the photoshops uh, that mm -hmm. have been done afterwards. I saw one with all of his you know, co-conspirators. They're all dressed up as uh, Batman villains. So that was my favorite. <laughs> just one where Trump has like a mustache. So I I'm enjoying that more than the actual mugshot. That said, though, it's just good to see this guy on, you know, with a mugshot. And let's, yeah, I, I have... I have sometimes I have hope that there's going to be some repercussions and you know maybe maybe some prison time. Other times I'm like there's no way he's you know he's too uh, he's too popular he's too famous he's not going to have any you know uh, face any real uh, repercussions. But I like that we're on the path towards potentially that happening. So it's yeah. it's it's a good move in the right direction. I, I don't even I, I mean again I. I... I, at least from the federal indictment, it seems so airtight, but but we can't make these determinations because there's so many factors that are completely out of the control of of everybody involved and also outside of, you know, what is rational here. I mean, it's just it's a swirling stew of, of a bunch of different factors. But um, back to the debate, the, the we also covered it as well. The C team. Uh, the VP auditions or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's, it, let, let's play this clip here of um, Trump responding to the debate. Uh, I guess Trump and Vivek uh, rhymes with cake, Ramaswamy have a bit of a bromance brewing. He's, he can't say Ramaswamy. He's been saying Ramaswamy. I'm not sure if he does that in this clip. Maybe he's figuring it out, but um, th that seems like the, Vivek's strategy is cozying up to Trump and um, being the candidate that is not threatening to him in any real meaningful way. But um, this is what Trump had to say about Ramaswamy's performance after he called into Greg Kelly's show on Newsmax quite late. Uh, he was running late and Greg Kelly had to extend past the, his traditional hour on Newsmax to accommodate him. Um, but here we go. As far as the stage last night, I thought it uh, Vivek, as we say, did very well. So actually, his name is Vivek, like cake. Yep. But I thought he was very good. I especially like where I said I was the greatest president in his lifetime and long beyond. That's pretty good. I said, are you sure he's running against me? But I thought he was very good. Uh, far as Sorry, can I just say, like, my recollection might be hazy uh, from that night, but I believe what Vivek said, Vivek said was, um, he's the best president of the 21st century, which is not of yeah. my lifetime. Well, <laughs> but good enough for me. Um, yeah, I just, I, it, he, it, it makes sense. Like what Vivek is doing is probably good. And, and for his career, right? Uh, he apparently was in talks at one point to be a daily wire guy. And that fell through natural, natural next step is running for president. Um, and for, I, I, I guess he's hoping at worst he'll get a very lucrative book deal out of this. 
Um, although he's nearly like his net worth is nearly a billion dollars, but he had a biotech company that, that was pump and dumped, uh, and dump. some yep. like, uh, failed turned out, um, medical, uh, um, procedures. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I mean, what is your reaction, I guess, to the way that Vivek Ramaswamy is running his campaign and how clearly it is seemed, uh, designed to appeal to, to Trump and MAGA world? Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you. I, I think this is clearly a move, a, a career move more than anything. Uh, you know, you could, you could look at someone even like Andrew Yang when it comes to the Democratic Party. Who the hell knew who that was until he ran for president? So it's it's more of like he's using this as a jumping off point for whatever hell, whatever the hell else he wants to do in the future. Maybe he's thinking, you know, I could move for a VP spot. I'm not sure if he even really wants that. I think he more just wants the attention. He wants to sell books. And, you know, I... I do we know why he's he rose so prominently? It, I mean, obviously the you know his wealth is a part of it, but why did the? I'm just curious why media latched onto him so quickly. It it seems like he really came out of nowhere, and now we all know who this guy is, and he's like skyrocketing. I, it seems very much, and I, I have no idea. I'm sure there's going to be more investigation into it, but like anti woke books, and yeah, stuff like that. and also mm, okay. he's very well financially connected with hedge funders and other kind of libertarian Wall Street freaks. We saw them, we saw them propel, um, you know, JD Vance to to the Senate. Uh, it's a maybe a different crew, but similar waters that they're swimming in, and then swimming in like backing guys like blake masters too there's there's this whole crop of uh you know faux populist libertarian rich guys that have a lot of deep pockets at their disposal trying to trying to 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 win political office that's my take yeah Makes from sense. the outside but um curious maybe if we could just take a quick pivot here uh david you are canadian I this know what's coming. This is uh, this is this is important context. Um, yes. As a Canadian, do you disavow Jordan Peterson? One hundred percent disavow. Okay. <laughs> well, good. We can keep. As you. do I think most Canadians do. I have to say, uh, though the, that, that voice he has, I got to. I think all Canadians are able to do the Jordan Peterson impression. It's just it's something innate within all of us. So he just he has really taken it on as his personality. But it's yeah. something that we all have the ability to uh, to perform. Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, a lot of Canadians are rejecting him, including the um, courts and uh, the courts ethics bodies and the ethics bodies for psychologists within Canada, because uh, maybe you shouldn't be able to use your massive platform to call Elliot Page's doctors criminal butchers, among you know other insane claims. God help anybody that was a, a patient in his practice. But um, Matt, you uh, you you did the deep so, dive to here. To me, this is the big the big um, sort of disciplinary uh, breakthrough that happened yesterday. Uh, you know, the mugshots one thing, but Jordan Peterson. Now, when you talk about him, you can officially call him uh, formally a professional disgrace. Uh, because he appealed a ethics uh, sort of ruling by the uh, I think the Society of um, uh, Ontario. What is it? The Association of Academic Psychologists, right. I mean, uh, college psychologists in Canada, um, and they're upset because, among other things, and we'll, uh, uh, you know, you can see how he characterizes it, but I'll characterize it beforehand. Um, saying things like Elliot Page's doctors are criminals, yeah. or uh, calling somebody a prick, uh, P R I K. Hey, David. Do Canadians spell prick P R I K or is that just a Jordan Peterson thing? I yeah, so I saw that misspelling and I, I got gotta be honest, I don't know how, I I don't think I've ever written down the word prick, so I'm not even sure okay. <laughs> um, exactly and, how we're supposed to spell it. And but, he also no, was his, like, yeah. Like very like glib about suicide, like saying, um, oh, I think there's an overpopulation problem. Then uh, go kill yourself, basically. And it's like, yeah. look, I, 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 like, I, I, am not a fan. <laughs> Probably of shouldn't do that as a psychologist. Yes, like yes. When, when you have also I'm make a, fun of someone's weight, like the the whole picture that he's like not beautiful, like that. When there's yeah. like eating disorders or an issue, like you can't be a psychologist and be talking That's about not affirming. Fat. Like, yeah, sorry, not yeah. sorry. Like, what does they say? Sorry, not attractive. Or sorry, not beautiful. And sorry, no amount not, of yeah. authoritarian yeah. times. We'll, we'll we'll put that up in a second. But just I want to because he he acts like they're not letting him like complain about the local like alderman. <laughs> and uh, what it is is like, hey, you're you're put you're one of us, and you put it in your bio that you're a clinical psychologist. Can you please not call like um practicing clinicians <laughs> criminals and talk about suicide like that but anyway um so he appealed that ruling to a court and the court uh well it came back to us yesterday 
hmm. we'll debate tonight. That's fun. Um, you know, I'm perplexed, I would say, about the situation in Canada. I've been thinking about it this morning. As you know, the 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 court that we appealed the College of Psychologists' decision to decided that the college has, it's within the college's purview to stop me from having any political opinions, as far as I can tell. Pause it one the, second. So, Jordan, <laughs> it's not just that you think like capitalism like takes people out of poverty. They're not saying, Jordan, please don't say that. They're saying... Don't call the like, gender affirming care doctors criminals yeah. with your giant platform. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I just want to say, he's, is he talking to his daughter here? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and he's wearing Imagine a, a zoot dad suit. was being professionally <laughs> disgraced. And the very first thing it is, is like, oh, let's get in front of millions of people. Mm-hmm. And you sort of explain it in a way that really doesn't sort of address the actual complaint, Jordan. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Stop me from... <laughs> having any political opinions as far as i can tell the the um the decision which i posted on twitter and will post in the description of this video starts out by making a case for the fundamental reality of freedom of speech for canadians in canada and then says but and that's always a bad start when you're talking about freedom of speech but Apparently, the college has the right to decide that I can be re-educated forcibly with the risk of my license. I don't know if they're going to be doing the milking tables that he's so afraid of, but I will just read from the, <laughs> from the uh, first uh, uh, you know, paragraph of this section. Um, reasons for the decision overview. When in- individuals join a regulated profession, they do not lose their charter right to freedom of expression. At the same time, however, they take on obligations that, and must abide by the rules of their regulatory body, body that may limit their freedom of expression. This case raises uh, the clash between a regulated clinical psychologist's right to speak in a certain manner and the regulators power to require the member to moderate that speech and they go through it like he had plenty of opportunities yes to say like yeah hey don't call that person a criminal or a prick or like and, and, and doesn't uh, he just have to take an uh, like an online yeah. course and that is the, the, that I, is the authoritarian all he had to do censorship a, all he had to do is take a social media course and yeah. that and this would, would have been like it but this is the this is why he's he he didn't do that, and why he doesn't ultimately care. He doesn't need he does he, first of all he's not currently practicing, so he yes. doesn't need this license. So it's better for it's more lucrative for him to use this as a way to play victim and use this you know as a way to you know this video has like what a million views now I bet like this is this is a new a new a new grip for him. Well, the, a hundred so, percent. I'm so pro free speech. They kicked me out of being a you know a clinical psychologist. I it's mean, all a bunch. Persecuted. It's all a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. Also, I guess, it's worth mentioning. Go ahead. Back in back in 2018, he also received a misconduct complaint while he was practicing, and at that point, he did agree to improve uh, what he had you know been criticized <laughs> of. So the well, the only thing that's changed now is that he has a Daily Wire contract, and he doesn't need <laughs> to be a practicing uh, a psychologist. So yes. that's why he's using this as a as a way to just grift. It's a little, yeah, exactly. It's a little bit of a of a burden on him now. But I gotta say, like, I do think they they this is the the this is um, short term thinking. I think like a quarterly profits thinking because, like Jordan, when uh, Joe Rogan has him on, he's like, this guy is a clinical psychologist. That is like part of the biography. I don't right. know if you're just a podcaster now. But but they the bump up cachet. against the actual practical realities of what they do, right? In the sense right. that like. You can only do this for so long. It's the same thing with Dave Rubin being a classical liberal. Once you get to a natural endpoint, you have to abandon it. And the cash cow goes away at that point because you're branding as this intellectual that's going to say what you want to, what, what the left doesn't want to hear. That goes away when people realize, actually, you're a lunatic and you don't even have a license anymore. Yeah, and it's not just the left. It's like professional ethics bodies, which mm-hmm. are very not, like, they're not actually concerned that you, uh, like, have these absolutely abhorrent retrograde views on like trans affirming care they just don't want you to advertise it publicly. yes yeah like, like that's why fr- it's not like re-education it's like social media training mm-hmm. yeah they're afraid of him undermining the way that the, that the college looks like the the undermining the regulatory body that oversees it for him to con- like he, and he knows all this stuff he's just playing stupid like the, this is the the guy is completely like his tweets sometimes like 
I'll I'll hear of a tweet he did and I go to and, and it's like that day I go to find it and I have to keep scrolling and scrolling. He's tweeting like every five minutes. I don't know what the and they're hell's all going hi- on with and it. they're all haikus. Like they they all have this <laughs> yeah, weird you know. Po- oh, there's like a Joker picture. Like <laughs> there's a lot of Joker pictures now. Apparently, it's all so. It's oh, so, so that's what he's leaning so into with the outfit. I mean, no, no, no. The outfit is uh, is a, a a suit version of his logo. And it has this. It, notice it's, uh, his, it's autographed as well. Yeah, <laughs> his, his own autograph is on it. <laughs> I now see that. I now see it all coming together. It yeah. is not aesthetically. I pleasing. thought he was sponsored by like um, you know uh, Reese's um, pieces yeah. or something like yeah. that. <laughs> not attractive suit. Sorry. But let's continue a little bit, Mari. It's really good. Because I made political statements that the members of the college don't agree with, and those ex- those. Those um, opinions involve two opinions. criticisms of Justin Trudeau, one criticism of his chief of staff, one criticism of an Ottawa city councillor, and then my objection on Joe Ro- Rogan to the climate apocalyptic fear mongering that idiot tyrants are foisting on the general population. Now let's go through now, this appara- a little bit, Bradley. I, I have a, uh, a clipped section there, or if you can go pick up the PDF, there's a section numbering the actual complaints about him. And uh, it's not really that, hey, don't criticize like local politicians. It's like, don't call them pricks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and like the thing he says with the Joe Rogan thing is kind of interesting to uh, get into. If you can uh, zoom in, yeah, Bradley. Um, uh, that to that B section there, yeah. Uh, various comments on the podcast. Um, uh, Doctor Pearson made on the January twenty fifth, two thousand twenty two appearance on the podcast Joe Rogan Experience. Peterson is identified as a clinical psychologist. Uh, see, that's a relevant part. They keep saying like he's identifying himself with this, which is why the body has to be like, hey, uh, tone it don't down, represent us. Um, uh, and spoke about a vindictive client whose complaint about him was a pack of lies. And then speaking about air pollution and child deaths, Doctor Peterson says. A quote, it's just poor children and the world has too many people on it anyways. Now, Jordan Peterson, um, that that I watched that full context, and Jordan Peterson is summarizing what he suggests as the anti um uh population or and or uh, too there's too much people on the he says like that's not true. The thing that's quoted that he says there, he actually later says uh, it's not true, but he can't get into that, which is kind of a misquote of him, because this entire thing is not really that he's criticizing climate policy. It's that he is telling people to kill themselves yes. <laughs> if they believe in overpopulation, which as a clinical psychologist, not something you like can do. I'm sorry. Like, even if I agree that like, I don't like overpopulation stuff. Um, I think it's like Malthusian, whatever. Right. Like I, I, I personally as a podcaster wouldn't say, Hey, go kill yourself yes. <laughs> for that. And, yeah. and I am not, uh, I'm clinical not like, a clinical psychologist. Yeah. Yeah, well, we have like a responsibility when you have a platform and how to use that platform. Like he, you know, he'll claim that he's being targeted because he's Jordan Peterson and saying these things. The reality is, the reason why this is a this is a problem is because of the platform that he has. And even so, during the uh, the initial complaint, there was a one of the psychologists came out and said, if I had done you know a quarter of the things that he said, I would be questioned. Like my license would be taken away. And yeah. that's someone who isn't well known, right? So you have somebody who. You know, you you magnify that times a million with someone like Jordan Peterson. It's even more important to deal with this because of the the uh, focus that is on him as this public figure. Yeah, and just another one. You know, lest you take his like, oh, they won't let me criticize the uh, local politicians. A tweet on February nineteenth, two thousand twenty-two, in which Doctor Peterson commented that Catherine McKenney, an Ottawa city councilor who uses they them pronouns, was a quote appalling, self righteous, moralizing thing thing yeah. oh yeah so it's like bro like, you're a- engaging in like active Ooh. dehumanization i'm uh, sorry for doing politics right like <laughs> yeah and and he still has the 100 percent right to engage in this in a capacity that is not as a, s- a clinical, clinical psychologist, psychologist. Uh, exactly. if he wants to to uh rip up and, and resign from his post or make sure that it's publicly clear that he's no longer acting in that capacity but that undercuts him from a financial perspective and and the branding that he's been yeah. putting forward um as this faux intellectual should we keep going yeah we should yeah they're mongering that idiot tyrants are foisting on the general population foisting. now apparently that makes me unprofessional and a uh, disgrace to the profession such that <laughs> I am now going to be required, the college can go ahead with this, to put me into a re-education program with their so-called social media experts 
And that's also, by the way, a profession that does not exist until I learn my lesson, whatever that is, regardless of how much time that takes, by their judgment, or they can take my license away. And so the, co the court says, well, of course you have freedom of speech, Dr. Peterson, but because you're a professional, you're bound by your professional organization. And apparently they're not bound, even though they're a government organization, fundamentally, apparently they're not bound by that fundamental constitutional axiom. And so that shows you what, all you- They're not, it's not like they're free speech that they're doing where they're like, it, it's they're they're a they can decide what their ethics are and who they're allowed to have represent them publicly that like i don't know what yeah. he's saying well you guys get to have free speech by saying i'm a freak that has bad opinions but i don't get allowed to have free speech that's a hypocritical yeah yeah th they have different standards than you know just general free speech in canada like that he can still go on and say whatever dumb shit he wants on twitter he just doesn't get to call himself a clinical psychologist it's pretty simple and uh, this is uh, again he he knows all this and he he is simply using this as a jumping off point because all he has to do is take this course but but he does not want to change how he behaves online i think that that's the most important uh, point here is that he even if he took the course he's not going to change and he realizes at some point it's going to be taken away anyways he but like I, i'm sure somewhere but maybe it's in his contract for the daily wire where you have to you know keep up this sort of uh this this <laughs> this sort of persona that he's developed for himself and Twitter is a main part of that. So he has to tweet this dumb shit all the all the goddamn time. Otherwise, he's not fulfilling whatever contract he has. And this is kind of like full circle for him because he, he came onto the scene with that sort of like freak out that's saying, I'm going to be gulagged unless I, you know, bow down to the, you know, the trans gods. Um, and it turned out that didn't happen. He's been free ever since then. Yeah. And the only, co the only issue he's had is with professional uh, ethics uh, organizations and not like the police. And everything's a re-education for him. I mean, the, the amount of victimization that he ascribes to, like, his very existence is just hilarious to me. I would love, like, you know, when I started here, I had to take, like, the New York State sexual harassment training. And, oh, my God, that was a half hour to 45 minutes out of my life. I was put into a re-education camp where I had to take a little quiz uh questions on the internet to say that i wouldn't you know comment on the physical physique of my coworker. um that's a re-education camp according to him he's so flimsy and weak like a, he could blow away like a leaf in the wind that's just how fragile that dude's ego is um is there more of course good you canadians who are listening and everyone outside of the country who might be the least bit interested in Canada, that shows you exactly what our bloody constitution is worth. <laughs> and if Canadians are so daft that they don't think that that's a problem, well, they're going to figure it out over the next 15 years because it's a long time. there's absolutely no excuse for this. So I, that's what I'm thinking. Now, there's part of me that's thinking, well, look, Peterson, the College <laughs> of Psychologists is after you. You've taken it to court. Now the judges have decided that you're wrong. Maybe you're wrong. And I think, well, I expressed political sentiment and I'm actually informed. And so <laughs> for the life of me, I can't see how I'm wrong. That person is I think prick. I have a responsibility to say what I think. And I think many people agree with that. And I think the fundamental consequence of oh. that around the world has been massively beneficial to people. Oh my God. So I think... I think, number one, what the hell? And number two, bring it on <laughs> and see what happens. Because I will make absolutely every bit of this public in a way that the college and the courts can hardly the even imagine. Oh, all right, pause we'll it for a second. see who cancels who. Uh, his Jesus complex is unreal. Go to a section oh 16 God. here uh, in, this, in, this, in this PDF that... that um, so this is what it says. Uh, on September 6, 2022, Dr. Peterson, Peterson rejected the ICRC's proposal. In a lengthy letter to the college, Dr. Peterson acknowledged that his various social media platforms he utilizes requires careful attention to and care to be used appropriately, and that he had already implemented a solution to respond to the college's concerns. Okay, so what are these solutions that he's referring to? Which included 
modification of the tone of my approach, <laughs> Dr. Peterson said that he had surrounded himself with people to help him monitor his public communications and provide him with continual feedback as to the appropriateness of tone and content of what I am purveying. These people included, Dr. Peterson said, his expert editorial teams at Penguin, Penguin Random House, which publishes his books, <laughs> members of his immediate family who work professionally with me, so his daughter. Who he can't be honest with about actually the complaints. He, he can't be like, oh yeah, they're mad I called that guy a prick and called that one counselor a thing and uh, said Elliot Page's uh, yeah. doctors were criminals. Um, and a very wide network of expert thinkers from the world of theology, psychology, politics, and business. Ben Shapiro. Uh, and, and people have also like <laughs> interpreted this as him saying it, it's his Twitter followers. Um, but uh, And then this is his exact quote. I would say then in my defense that I have already undertaken the remediation of my actions in a manner very much akin to what has been suggested by the IR ICRC and have done so in an exceptionally thorough and equally exceptionally public and transparent manner and would like to therefore submit to the ICRC that I have already and plan to continue to atone for what are no doubt my multiplicity of sins in relation to my interaction with the public audience that I have privilege <laughs> a privilege to serve. So like um I'm not sure what remediation he's referring to there except for him saying that uh he like has spoken to his publisher, his daughter and has engaged in Twitter discourse which counts as some counts as remediation within the context of the College of Psychologists of Ontario. It's just I mean Dude, just give it up already. Yeah, and it's funny. Like he's never really wanted to. Like he, he like Elon let him back in despite the um, um, Elliot Page thing. But IRC concerns. This is from Section Seventy One. The IRC's concerns with Dr. Peterson addressing Elliot Page as quote her and by their prior name, as well as calling a city councilor a thing and a doctor a criminal. Like, bro. Be honest with your daughter, bro. How can how can you come here and say they won't even let me, you know, criticize the local levies that they're like? Be honest with why you're being criticized. Yes, it is not political opinions. It's not you saying even that climate change is a hoax. It's you saying, hey, you believe in overpopulation? Go kill yourself. Yeah, That's signed a clinical psychologist. <laughs> I do wonder how much of this is an act and how much of it he truly believes because he's he's clearly worked himself into believing that he is the victim here. Yeah. But, you know, when the doors are closed, when the cameras are off, is he sitting there thinking they're right? <laughs> like, he had... Yeah. He's a smart enough guy to know. Like he has, to, especially but considering in 2018, he acknowledged it. he had problems and he, he tried to change them. It's yeah. just he doesn't need that. He doesn't need that license now. So it's, it's a different situation. I got remediated in Russia. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's. <laughs> yeah, he, he was he the coma um, totally was my me repenting for my uh, sins. It, uh, I'll meet diet, and you still want me to stop saying these things about doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no amount of self-flagellation will be enough for you authoritarian <laughs> freaks. I'm also wondering if this is an avenue for him to like hang out with his daughter. Well, Did that whole thing is just, uh, what uh, is, she says, hi dad. Good to see you. And he's like, hi Mick. What's up? Actually, we can continue. I think there's a little bit more awkwardness maybe oh. on that front. Oh. Um, Cause she's like, oh yeah. So you're doing okay then. <laughs> <laughs> You're not talk off camera. <laughs> so away we go. So that's how I'm doing. That's how you're doing. Okay, but good. <laughs> yeah, but good. You know, I mean, <laughs> I didn't look. The court decision was worse than I thought it would be. I was already pessimistic. I figured the court would take the coward's way out and basically upbraid the college for procedural inadequacy because one of the things the college that's it um procedural inadequacy and, and it turns out the court is like actually this procedure was adequate and you need to uh slow your fucking roll or be done being a clinical psychologist yeah it's very <laughs> very reasonable ah oh, well so now uh, just everybody just a style guide update whenever you talk about jordan peterson you can say disgraced um a clinical uh or former now disgraced clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson. That's fun. Definitely. All right, David. Well, uh, we'll let you go now, but anything you want to plug? I mean, we talked a bit about your channel uh, over there, The Rational National. Everyone should check that out. You do great work. Um, Leftist Mafia. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Just uh, therationalnational.com, and that will take you to the uh, YouTube page or therationalnational.com slash join. That's the Patreon page. And yeah, every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, we do the uh, Left's Mafia podcast live. Awesome. All right. Well, really appreciate you coming on. Uh, always, a good, uh, always good to chat with you. Talk to you soon. Thanks.
All right. See ya. With that, we're going to wrap up the free part of this program and head into the fun half. Not sure if we'll take calls today because we just have an hour and it's always hard on Fridays. We're tired. Yeah. Yeah, we're <laughs> tired. I don't know if that comes is coming across. <sighs> Although I actually have a lot of energy thinking about Jordan Peterson. It is. I'm fine. Yeah, a really good day. Except, like, my entire life's crumbling around me. <laughs> First of all, what the hell? <laughs> I was expecting them to say, "Actually, you guys are being too woke," but it turns out that they think I'm a unprofessional freak. Yeah, um, his indignance is just on another level. Maybe next week there's a Daily Wire video of like you know that crew sitting around in backstage area like mm -hmm. they do um, reacting to the decision. So Maybe. I, I, I just oh, there is one? There is one. Oh, yeah, I just yes. haven't watched it yet but we can see how they're um, learning about like I'm trying to think of like what the comparison would be like if Sam was stripped of like his seg after a yeah or something. <laughs> right right and i'd be like actually like it, it's embarrassing it's just an embarrassment and it and it, it goes back to my broader point which is they like to act like all these culture war things are against the left and like as a part of the like socialist communist left i like that i would love that to be a big bigger part of society but when they talk, when they're coming for trans people, they are against like basic um, clinicians <laughs> and um, like um, psych um, pediatrics and psychiatric organizations. Not that those should be the final arbit arbitrator, but just don't let them um, sort of bluff about. Oh, we're just up against these like um, blue hairs on Tumblr. Mm -hmm. Exactly, um, Matt. What's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, Left Reckoning, R.M. Brown is going to be joining David Griscom and I to talk about the Communist Manifesto. Ever heard of it by a little guy named Karl Marx and his buddy, uh, jo uh, Frederick Engels. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we're talking about that. Probably the first uh, section or maybe the first two sections. So uh, patreon.com says Left Reckoning uh, to get access to that. All right. And on ESVN, we spoke about that Spanish uh, Football Federation sexual assault on camera at the World Cup award ceremony. I mean, it's just like that sentence is insane. Uh, we spoke more about the Michael Orr story. We took some calls, uh, gave some preseason reactions. And hopefully on Monday, we're going to have a fantasy expert on, which will be very exciting because drafts right around the corner. Uh, I can almost... It's so close, I can almost taste it. Um, all right, guys. Going to head into the fun half, although 502 Drew writes in, Sam misses Donald Trump's mugshot, and now you're going to pile on by covering this Jordan Peterson clip? Yeah, I mean, snooze you lose, buddy. All right, guys. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? Dan 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 Arky. <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. bring back DJ Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflake says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason 
why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Needs to pay the price of blast to be around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, 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 and I'll never forget it, having lettuce you, in my teeth. They heard, they let you hear about it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Or like it was, you know, it might have been Or you just noticed or, about it. And then... uh, yeah, perhaps. I mean, either way, it's just, you know, I got to place my anxiety somewhere. Um, Colleen from Connecticut, to answer David Dole's question about Binder, Coca-Cola, lots of Coca-Cola. A normal person is like 60% water. Binder is 70% Coca-Cola. That's how he streams till sunrise. True. Um, Jasma sound. Oh my God. Jordan Peterson's overly verbose whiny way of speaking just drives me up a wall. I would strip him of his freedom of speech rights just to, for that to be, uh, honest, but your imitations of him are like therapy to my ears. Keep it up guys. Um, the real thing that Jordan Peterson is discovering, uh, like, isn't that like the constitution should like your guarantee your right to free speech by like any sort of association needs to allow you to say whatever you want and continue being associated with it. But the real way to guarantee free speech, and I've been saying this since John Ronson's uh, So You've Been Publicly Shamed book um, uh, about that woman who said the tweets and it's like, has Justine landed yet thing? But the real way to do free speech, uh, 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 the real problem with free speech is to decommodify the essentials so that if you do say something um, or you're like, for instance, calling doctors criminals and want to continue to be able to do that. Um, you're not financially ruined? You're not ruined. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Dan from Columbus, underrated but worth mentioning. Michaela Peterson almost killed her dad when she gave him COVID while partying in Europe with Andrew Tate. Oh, boy. Um, Brandon Tarkatoff, why do we always forget that this critic of others, Jordan Peterson, spent the better part of a year addicted to benzos, probably kidnapped in Russia by his daughter and her boyfriend? I still don't understand how he was allowed to come back from all this. And I... Um, kind of feel like it was because our side was reluctant to pile on and kick him when he's down. I remember a lot of sensitive disclaimers about mental health and addiction at that time. No. I get that we don't want to be cruel to... No. Uh, I, I don't think this is why. The, the reason Jordan Peterson persists isn't because we were too kind in that moment, because I saw a lot of people that weren't kind uh, and appreciated <laughs> it. Like, I, yeah. and I don't think that the things would be meaningfully changed if everybody was doing that. Like The th reason Peterson persists is because he's an asset he's invested in yeah <laughs> there's capital behind him yes and they like what he says and the credibility that he's built up somehow um and so that's why well, and, and he so, directs anger towards like a, a you know a, an unjust society towards women in, 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 that's exactly. very useful he's been the hierarchy naturalizer with uh, some yeah. of the vocabulary the entire time so he's valuable to them um and so that's why he persists i think his value is running out i will say oh yeah you can be spent and like that it, it's it's almost like Daily Wire is um, given contracts to the players after they get the, the sort of <laughs> yes. biggest work. He's, he's doing the Knicks like for uh, yeah, the exactly past 20 the years. Knicks. Yeah. <laughs> give Carmelo a big contract. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Amari, Amari Stoudemire's <laughs> knee is like blown out again. Jordan Peterson losing the ability to call himself a clinical psychologist is like Amari Stoudemire losing his ACL. Yeah. <laughs> um, but honestly, they have so much money that it does. It, actually, it's more akin to like a baseball team doing that where they have no salary cap. Um, you know, just to stretch the metaphor even further for the audience. Um, 
St. James, hello and happy Casual Friday and Majority R- Report crew. I am on behalf of Lux with some good news. The NLRB has ruled that if bosses commit unfair labor practices in the run-up to a union election, then the election will be canceled and the board will order the employer to immediately 